Well, at first, I, I would say that it's uh, both an honor and a privilege for me to be um, invited here to such an esteemed audience. Because um, uh, so I'm kind of very proud to be part of this movement of taking this country back. I, this semester, I was on leave of absence, was teaching in the University of Dallas in Texas. And spoke there, I couldn't believe it, I spoke at the 16 Tea Party meetings. Uh, all over Texas, and the people coming from completely different backgrounds, completely different, politically very different, but what the great thing about them is that they know what they don't want. And definitely they don't want socialism in this country. Well, I was listening to my kind of bizarre big background. Yes, I worked for, for the Soviet government, well, the word work is kind of a huge overstatement of my activities there. <laughs> In Soviet Union, we had a saying, they pretend they pay us and we pretend we are working for them. <laughs> so there was a pretense all over the place. And then I defected to the United States um, to find myself employed by the second largest bureaucracy of this planet, by the federal government in Washington, D.C. I worked in a congressional think tank United States Institute of Peace, which, like all congressional think tanks, didn't think at all. We did a lot of tanking, however, I think. And uh, so I decided to do something positive with my life, and uh, so I'm teaching economics in um, Wisconsin, which is forgetting economics all the time. You can see that people, people Republic of Wisconsin, that's uh, also part of our Midwestern flyover country, as, as politicians would say, um, uh, that Madison right now is a center of class warfare as much as, say, Moscow was in 1917. So the enemies of freedom are fighting back. And uh, <clears throat> I think that we should really keep in mind that we reached already a point of almost no return. It was um, <clears throat> that that great Austrian economist Friedrich August von Hayek, he wrote a wonderful book, Road to Serve Them, Road to Serve Them. And I'm pretty proud that, that I advised um, Glenn Beck to do a program on that book. And that book show, was shot up as, a, as number one bestseller in the United States. Number one bestseller. It's a pretty obscure book, published in 1944 by Austrian economist. And uh, then it became for Two months, bestseller number one, bestseller number one. So I would like to kind of begin it as a, as a typical college professor to, 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 to kind of <laughs> give you reading materials. Then another thing I think I would advise you to, to watch. Uh, you can watch it, I think, for free uh, on YouTube, or you can buy a DVD. This is uh, a video called Soviet Story, Soviet Story, because not many people in this country know Soviet story. This video was produced in the former Soviet Republic of Latvia by, uh, by a young producer, Edwin Schnorre. And Edwin Schnorre already got life threats for this video. Uh, his effigy was burned in Moscow, and Latvian ambassador to Moscow was beaten up by the, by the bunch of fascist thugs of Mr. Putin's of Mr. Putin's making. <clears throat> so this video is telling us an untold story, untold story of atrocities committed by socialists. Um, I was, was listening to, uh, to Mr. Weber's presentation and I would wholeheartedly agree with him that we should at first clean up our language. That we should, Confucius used to say, when words would lose their meaning, people would lose their liberty. And that's just extremely important, extremely important. And, and that's why I deliberately never use the word communism. Because the word communism is used by socialists to have kind of like a free right that it was communists who were so bad. Communists were murdering people. Communists, communists didn't work, but socialism does work. Socialism is different, can be humane, can be socialist, that's what we're all about. So communism, if we'll just talk a little bit about terms, uh, the word communism was used by Karl Marx as utopia, as some future happening, which according to his letters to Engels, his buddy, 
that would that would occur 500 years from now, 100, 500 years from now. So, communism. When we're talking about communism, communism is a secular religion. It's a secular religion which is promises us a fantastic new world, a fantastic world of plenty, of freedom, of withering of government. Can you imagine that Karl Marx, uh, who created, who, and who was an intellectual engineer of this mass murder of the 20th century, he was talking about withering of the state, then uh, people would work for free because it'll be such a wonderful people. The people would work for free, then they would go to some kind of warehouse warehouse publicly owned but without government will be kind of like Walmart or Costco and then they go there and pick up whatever they like for free there is no cash registers there so that was that was what was promised that was what promised if you read Marx about communism you can see that was it is really a religion religion and that's the reason that they were so harsh on religion on the families on everybody else because then you, if you are a socialist, you want a monopoly on thought. And every other idea, which is not, which is not yours, um, uh, should be eliminated. And the ideas usually are, are housed in, the, in, the, in the people's minds, people's minds. Stalin used to say that mistakes do not erupt. Every mistake has a home, has a home. So we should go and remove these homes. No people, no problems. No people, no problems. So well, it's <clears throat> the story of mass murder, I would say, in a, I'll go a little bit. Yes, yeah, so socialism was the deadliest disease and still is, and still is. According to Radio um, Rummel, professor of demographics, University of Hawaii, 226 million people were murdered by their own governments in the 20th century. And the most, the, the perfect killer state was the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union. These numbers are being questioned, but I remember very well that during Perestroika, Mr. Gorbachev decided to put some ministers of his government on the spot, on TV, to be interviewed publicly uh, with a call-in programs. And so, uh, Krychkov, Vladimir Krychkov was the chief of KGB, and they put him on the spot, and uh, one caller said, well, I, I kind of came up with 43 million people who were murdered by your institution. Is that a true number? And Mr. Krychkov said, I kind of don't know. How about meeting here a week from now? And then I will we'll, we'll, we'll discuss this number. So a week later, the chief of KGB is there, and he said, the, mom, the number is about right, he said, but it's preposterous to think, comrades, that these people were killed. Most of them died of natural causes. And then the moderator was brave enough, and she said, but on the premises of, your, of KGB. He said, well, people die everywhere, on our premises as well. And then she was, she was brave enough to say, especially if you don't feed them, or you don't clothe them in Siberia, then they die of natural causes. And so he said, well, I think this is too hostile for me to continue. So that was 43 million, that's what he admitted. The number is about right. Solzhenitsyn Foundation, he has research staff, not just by himself, and Rudy Rammel from University of Hawaii, he's also extremely interesting reading for you, if you are interested in that period, in the mass murder of the 20th century, uh, it's his book, Death by Government, Death by Government. So he believes that government is the most deadliest disease of the 20th century, that more people were murdered by their own governments than, than even by, uh, during wars, during wars. And, 38 million people died on battles, battlefields in the 20th century, the deadliest century in human history. And uh, 226 million were murdered by their government, unrelated to wars, unrelated to wars. Why socialism cannot survive without mass murder? Because there is no incentives, there is absolutely no, nothing in that system which would make 
and normal, rational people work or do what your leaders are telling you. I am working right now, I got a small grant and I'm working at the Library of Congress on a fascinating archive by General Dmitry Volkogonov. Uh, he was, Dmitry Volkogonov was a commander of the Soviet Institute for Military History and member of the Central Committee of the party. And he was a propaganda person whom I hated so much that any time he would be on TV, I would switch it right away off. And uh, however, I never would expect, never would even think in my wildest dreams that he was the person who bought for his institute a Xerox machine, put it in his back room, and was making highly illegal copies of everything going through his desk. So all of the most secret memos of handwritten materials by Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin, Khrushchev, Brezhnev, Andropov, and even Gorbachev, he would have copies of that. In 1996, he was, a, he was a national security advisor to President Yeltsin, and he developed terminal disease, he developed cancer of liver, and he, um, and he approached the United States ambassador in Moscow, asking him how to move his archive, 42 boxes, from his dacha to the United States. And the ambassador said, well, I will, I will put you in contact with the people from the agency, meaning the Central Intelligence Agency, and they will help. And he said, no CIA, no. Uh, he said, Library of Congress, it should, be, it, should, it should be available for anyone. And if the CIA would like to read that, let them get a reader's card and, and do that. <laughs> and, and so, and I am, I think I am just the only one who working with them because they're not even sorted, not even sorted. There's this films, it's just to say this is, this is this period and that's another period or whatever. So I'm looking at this randomly. I'm, I'm sorry that I'm too old to it because there'll be thousands of doctoral dissertations or books could be written on, on that materials, which is unique. And, and I came through from just randomly looking. Uh, Lenin, in 1922, he was already a sick person. He is writing to, to chief of VCK, at that time KG, KGB was named like that. Felix Dzerzhinsky, Polish, Polish mass murderer and, uh, and communist and socialist. And uh, he's writing to him is saying, Dear Felix, I'm telling, telling people what to do and they don't listen. And I'm tired of that. What if we'll take a couple of these absent-minded comrades and shoot them publicly? And they did, and attention span was enhanced. And then they began shooting people more and more and more. And if you will look at the history of Soviet Union, then the highest amount of people shot was in 1930s. In 1937, 12,000 people a day would be, would be liquidated. And at that time, they had the highest rates of economic growth, the highest rates of economic growth. Sure enough, incentives can be positive and can be negative. And I would say that this mass murder, anywhere from 43 to 61 million people, that's the number of Rudy Rammel and Solzhenitsyn, uh, that, that this is even irrelevant for me, 43 or 61. It's mind-boggling amount. Stalin himself used to say, death of one person is a tragedy. Death of a million is just statistic. Just statistic. And so why would they kill so many? Because what socialism is, is a system of public slavery. It's a system of public slavery which is even worse than private slavery. I would say private slavery is disgusting by itself because but what's in common between private and public slavery is that people do not make decisions. The slaves do not make decisions. They do not have choices. These choices are made for them by their owners, whether are private owners or public owners. Because what is freedom? Freedom is choice, nothing else. So if you don't have a choice, then you are not free then you are not free. So this is, this is extremely, public slavery is the most deadly slavery, definitely, because, because it has, uh, it has the, same, uh, the, the same kind of compassion as the post office. It's, uh, it's people don't care, that's not theirs. Even slave owners, the leaders, political leaders of socialist countries, they don't care about how many millions of, this, of these people would perish, because most of these people, were supposed to be killed 
to make a better man of tomorrow, a better man of tomorrow, the new man, new man. Well, if we will turn and kind of and look at the, why the Soviet Union collapsed then. Because I would say, um, Mr. Gorbachev, my, my boss, he, he, had, he was kind of confused on, on uh, I don't, if he would, we, we never knew what, what was happening. We kind of were pretty frustrated. Uh, we were thinking, what's behind this birthmark? I mean, just uh, nobody could, could guess. Even my boss, our immediate boss, who was a, the, the first deputy prime minister, and his confidant and in charge of economic reform, Abel Agan began. He, we call him the biggest economist in the world. He was even bigger than me. I was um, maybe 500 pounds at least. And uh, so now I'm getting into that. But, uh, but he, yes, he was very much frustrated by, by what was going on. And he didn't know, nobody never knew what Mr. Gorbachev is up to. Because he was talking about socialism with a human face, with a human face. And when Abel again began at one of the meetings with Gorbachev, he raised the question. He said, well, we probably need to build a Swedish model here. The Swedish model is kind of socialism and human face. And Gorbachev said, OK, Abel, but where would you get all the Swedes to make the model? <laughs> and sure enough, I think he was, he was pretty, pretty right. Then uh, why I'm talking about this seemingly unrelated to medicine uh, areas, because they are very much related. Because medicine is a part of every society, part of every economy. And definitely, if everything was falling apart, so was medicine, so was medicine. Besides that, medicine was never, well, keeping people healthy was never an, a primary goal of bureaucrats, primary goal of bureaucrats. And so that was, uh, that was because if you have slaves, you definitely need to keep up some slaves more or less healthy to, for them to build Egyptian pyramids that they littered the whole Soviet, Soviet Union with. Uh, they were reversing rivers, eradicating deserts and whatnot, and completely destroyed environment in the process, completely destroyed environment in the process. Even Boris Yeltsin, uh, that's a person I had a dubious pleasure of working with for a while, um, even he would say that Soviet Union became environmental Auschwitz, environmental Auschwitz, because again, that's not yours, that's not yours. What protects environment, what protects us in the United States and other more or less free countries, it would be property rights, property rights. Property rights were officially, officially prohibited in the Soviet Union, and private property was considered to be a theft, considered to be a theft. And the only way to rule in that, in that kind of society was to resort to mass murder, to kill people. Um, there's um, uh, Alexander Yakovlev, uh, who was political advisor to Gorbachev and secretary of the Communist Party himself. He was definitely one behind these ideas of destroying socialism. He was, um, he, was, he was pretty good. I think he was a true hero. We don't know about him much. Recently, he wrote a book, Murder of Children in the Soviet Union, in which he, he, he also come up with this gruesome numbers of 11 million children which were murdered in the Soviet Union to prove that socialism works. The idea was also, you can imagine, the idea is, was that, that it is, as Stalin used to say, it's much easier to make a new person rather to reform an older one. So that's they just make more children, yes. And these children, because they came from a bad apple tree, and then if you kill their father, as he used to say, then it's probably a pretty high chance that this, this child would not like you, would not like you. And so why should we breed enemies? Why should we breed enemies? My, my own grandfather was murdered by Stalin in 1939, and uh, <clears throat> my father's life was completely destroyed by that only after Stalin was denounced by Khrushchev uh, for different reasons, uh, different than real truth, definitely. Uh, then he could get an education, became uh, quite famous by a, physicist, uh, by a physicist. I came from medical family myself. I am the only black sheep in the family. My sister, she is a, she is a research professor in genetics in the University of Chicago. 
My mom was bio, bio, biochemist, she right now is retired, and my father was biophysicist, and my grandfather and grandmother all were medical people. So I heard medical stories, gruesome medical stories all the time, all the time. And definitely it was, it was uh, quite, a <coughs> quite an experience. Um, speaking about, about socialism, so why did it fail? Because socialism can be based only on fear. And Mr. Gorbachev was all the time talking about socialism with human face. That we should revert to human face socialism, to humanistic socialism. It would be so attractive, so attractive to people like, I would say, like our president today, for example, or uh, other people. So they would, they would try to embrace that. They would try to embrace that. And we were all the time thinking, does he understand that this is inevitable? If you have social, inevitable. The mass murder is inevitable. And um, however, people, when people realize that he was he talking about human face, that, that there will be no shootings anymore, and people stopped working. And that's why the system imploded. That's why the system fell like a card house, uh, because fear was removed out of system, which was glued together only by fear was a nice, um, I think, joke at that time, at in, in, in the end of 1980s, that the CIA sent the best agent to Moscow to find out about perestroika. What is perestroika about? What is going on there? And this agent is going with a little notebook, going to the butcher shops, writing no meat, going to the bakery, no, no bread, going to the shoe store, no shoes. And there is a KGB person looking over his shoulder, and he said, Ten years ago, you would be shot for doing that. He writes there, no bullets. So that's when, <laughs> when, when people realize that they run out of bullets, then everybody stopped working. Stop work. The most unfortunate thing, that everything what I'm talking about, it also applies to medicine. Also applies to medicine. The quality of work in medical institutions since 1918 was appalling. Uh, the only health care you could get in the Soviet Union, you should either join Communist Party and become one of the leaders, they had their own system, but in the system for gray masses, that would be bribes, 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 and bribes. Uh, to the point that even in today's Russia, medical sector is the largest recipient of bribes, of bribes. They even they were even thinking that it's about $1.5 billion. That's kind of a private, private markets are getting in uh, because this is, the, this, is, uh, this is very similar. I mean that definitely healthcare system in Canada is much better than in the Soviet Union just because they have less of that socialism. They have a little and they have a lot of problems already. Uh, if, you, if you go that way, in North Korea, there is no, there is no healthcare system, there is a system of mass murder only, of mass murder. So this is, I think, what we should definitely keep in mind. There is no evidence that, nor statistical, nor theoretical, that if markets are good in doing something, that, that, that government would be better. For what reason? For what reason? Because there is no profit motive. Then, then that means there will be no efficiency, no efficiency. It was, I think, um, <laughs> my sister told me a joke, just, just came, uh, to, uh, never, I think, told anyone in the United States, uh, that um, medical school, which she was graduating herself in Moscow, they have a, <clears throat> they have a graduation exam, the so-called state exam, or uh, state licensing exam. And so <clears throat> they're asking one person, uh, one, one, one man uh, uh, showing him two skeletons saying, whose skeletons are these? And, uh, and he's looking at the skeletons. He said, oh, I remember everything, but I'm so nervous. I just cannot. And everybody's trying to prompt him, even members of the state commission. That's trying to say the man, ma male and female skeleton. But he can't hear. And so then, and, and, and then the chairman of the commission said, well, Whose skeletons are this? What you were doing in the medical school for seven years? And he said, oh, I forgot. This is Marx and this is Lenin. <laughs> and that's, uh, I think that's exactly what people were trained in, were trained in. 
that in the Soviet Union there were so many doctors, the same in Cuba today. However, the, the, the vital statistics was, was, well, vital statistics was not reliable in, in the Soviet Union as well as any other statistics. But even vital statistics, we had interesting, it was like a matryoshka doll. For example, I worked for the government and I had an access to classified statistics. And then at certain points, even to top secret statistics. But and official statistics were available for everybody. Official statistics was just garbage. The only thing, the only people who believed, uh, believed um, in official Soviet statistics would be people from Harvard or Princeton or <laughs> University of California, Los Angeles. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not making it up. Um, uh, you remember maybe Laura D'Andrea Tyson. Laura D'Andrea Tyson, she was chief economist for, uh, for uh, Mr. Clinton, uh, the Clinton administration. And uh, she wrote uh, her PhD is comparative economists of Eastern Europe. And in which, which was published in 1986, and I was given by my boss to read this book and kind of make an assessment. And I couldn't believe it that she, she believed that Romania is the best country in the world from point of view of, of, of statistics. And uh, Romania, and I had a friend who was Romanian working for the, for the Council of Mutual Economic Cooperation in Moscow, which is, we called it Council for Mutual Economic Destruction, and, and, and I asked him, his name was, was a nice guy, Ion Draculescu, called him Dracula, and, and uh, he, he smelled alcohol at like 8 o'clock in the morning already. And I asked him, how do, you make sta how, do you, how do you fake statistics? I mean, the people believe in the United States, you have 14% of, of economic growth. And he said, we, we are not like Russians, we are not like Soviets, we do not fake statistics. And I was so surprised, and he said, we make statistics. I said, well, <laughs> what's the difference? He said, well, to fake, that means you have a number you, you should fake. That was CIA doing all the time. They were thinking that we know everything and we just should torture somebody to, to give it up. And um, I, to make statistics, he said, so easy. I said, how? You, you just look at the ceiling and, and then at a certain point you see numbers. And I, I said, I'm working in the ceiling. I don't see anything. So we'll have a drink. and. <laughs> and, and then, and then you, you put down these numbers, then you go to your boss, and your boss will correct you. Yeah, the boss will say, this is too much or too little or whatever. Correct you, and that's statistics. Yeah, that's statistics. And, and I recollected the same kind of approach uh, in Cuba. In Cuba, they have this fantastic uh, maybe. But I downloaded, I was looking to kind of to, to look at, at Cuba, what what people in the United States, what the doctors in the United States believe about, about uh, healthcare in Cuba. And amazingly enough, most of that is, is I think, uh, uh, drawn from Michael Moore's um, uh, movies, yes. I downloaded a, a, a UCLA professor of medicine, of med medical ethics, medical ethics, that's the, I think that's medical ethics. It's, it's like sociology. Yeah, it's every, only Marxists, Leninists. And so he downloaded that. I downloaded that. And he is discussing Cuban statistics, saying that in Cuba, well, they have, um, they have, they, they forced to admit that they have higher infant mortality rate in, than the United States. We have seven, they have 7.2. 7.2. How does he know? <laughs> because, um, because in Cuba, a, a Cuban friend told me that that um, in Cuba, statistics of mortality, infant mortality statistics uh, usually is being registered after half a year or later after the, the, the birth of the, of, of the infant. So then if you, because infant mortality rate is mortality of infants within the first year, when the first year uh, of life, then if you register them on their first birthday, then you don't have any infant mortality, just zero, period. But that kind of doesn't sound believable, so that's why they came up to 7.2. In, in, uh, in the same piece of that, of that, I think his name is Mark Schenker, and um, what he is also pointing out that, that in Cuba, I don't know where he got that number, that gross domestic product per person is $1,700. And they spent about $106 per year per person on medicine, on medicine, $106.
So this, this sounds outrageous to me as well, because average wage in Cuba is $9 per month. $9 per month. And the only health care we discussed uh, with uh, also my Cuban friend, uh, that is to swim to Miami. Uh, no, no other, no other health care there. Then, then I haven't seen, I haven't seen, oh, I, I'm thinking, do you think we can put some health care pictures. I, I hate to do that after this wonderful dinner, but because I know it, but you are all doctors, so that's your occupational hazard. Your occupational hazard to look at an unpleasant race. Uh, and uh, Cuba was a great place to take students to, because then, then, uh, uh, oh, this is ambulance. <laughs> But returning back to, to why would this healthcare be so, so disgusting? Um, this is from, from the website, The Real Cuba. Uh, it's an interesting website if you are interested in. This uh, little dots are flies. Flies. So wonderful, proud, beautiful people uh, under such a disaster that's, uh, that it is. And it said that providing great dignity to the older ones, to the older ones. So that's there. This is Cuba. Well, I, not all Cuba looks like this, but this is very, was very near and dear to a Soviet person. This is a ration desk. This is, a, this is what, what they, they can, you can see what you can buy during one month, during one month. This is a store for Cubans, for Cubans. So they have some, you can buy, for example, three pounds of rice, three pounds of beans, about 200 grams, that means one glass of vegetable oil, um, one toothbrush in four months. And there is a lot of things like this. And I was, as a Soviet, I was so surprised, and I was immediately asked, what is that? And they said, it's baking soda. Baking. So, well, I mean, you can have a heartburn because people are starving, but, but they use baking soda for a lot of, for a lot of things. Yes, and maybe we'll put Russia. Um, that's uh, another. Well, Cuba had more of this socialism than that's even than today's Russia. But that's also, you can see it's bleak and grim to the point. I'm not saying that's what, what, what is going on. Today it's a little bit better in many places. Uh, but this is a typical Soviet hospital, typical Soviet hospital. And, uh, it's kind of like a, a they, they call it morgue with live people. And so it is, it is pretty, pretty gruesome. Um, I spoke recently at the University of Iowa, and the organizers of my, of my presentation, uh, trying to reach out, presented me, I think, as a kind of a Marxist missionary from Moscow, that I came to convert everybody. <laughs> And so I had a pretty hostile audience, and a huge hostile audience. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, was kind of amazing that one lady, uh, probably a professor, she stood up and she said, you are like Sarah Palin. You came here to scare us. And I do. Yeah, I can openly admit that. That's what I really want to do. I want to scare all people I can about socialism. I wish somebody could come and scare us in Russia in 1917. I wish somebody could come and scare Cubans in 1959 or Chinese in 1948 because it was such a waste of human lives. Just unbelievable. Besides that, even if you will look at, at, at the, at the uh, healthcare bill which was passed, uh, and you look again, that looks like Republican leadership is not doing almost anything to repudiate this bill. I mean, uh, Speaker Boehner, he said, well, this is when we will win, when we will win the, the Senate, when we will talk about that. How can he win the Senate if he would not oppose evil, oppose evil right now? Because then, then that would be amazing. <laughs> then, um, if you will look um, what there is in the bill, 
whether it's uh, some people say it's not social. No, it is. It is socialism. If you look at the public option, that's exactly, exactly kind of the what Lenin was calling a, a link in the chain that you can pull the whole chain out. So if you will pursue, uh, as economist, I can just uh, can can attest that if you pull this public option, which is publicly funded. Then, uh, then that would be the end of, of, the, of what we have as remnants of the market in our health care. Because health care is, is presented to us today as kind of like a free market which had driven us to the, to the dead end that the kind of the free market screwed up the health care would not. Without realizing that already today over half of all health care is being paid by government that even today, 54%. If you will look at the Medicare, Medicaid, Veterans uh, Hospitals, Bureau of Indian Affairs Hospitals, uh, then you, you look at the county levels, and they have a lot, of, a lot of socialists coming not only from Washington, D.C., but also from Lincoln here, from Madison in, in, in Wisconsin, uh, uh, from Des Moines and I, we have our own little, little Stalins and Hitlers and Obamas all over the place. And they, and they all want to, I kind of speak about Mr. Obama, he reminds me, he reminds me very much, um, very much about, about um, our beloved leaders in Moscow. He has, however, they would all look much older definitely and, and different skin pigmentation and whatnot, but but he has the same stern look, the same, same stern look that makes you uneasy, that, that he has the look of a person who knows the truth, who knows the truth, and dealing with others as with gray masses. So returning back to the to that, to healthcare bill, it would be administered on the, on the model which I think all of us resent. It will be the same as unified school districts. You would have regional, 185, I think, different regional healthcare administrations, and they would decide, and they would be, would be I mean, people call it death panels. Uh, well, you, you can call it whatever you like, but, but it is completely strange that people do believe that you can make savings, savings on healthcare without either squeezing providers or denying care. I mean, if you if you if you're, you don't need to be a rocket science or or have a PhD in economics, I think PhD in economics would be even bad, even kind of bad choice, because then it impedes some people thinking um, a lot. It's kind of adverse selection, as Hayek would say, and uh, because um, because yes, it's uh, it's it, it is obvious that either you. Either you're on supply side or on demand side. I mean, you should put a damper on spending here, here or there. And this, uh, why we have skyrocketing healthcare costs? Um, because of technology, definitely. So now they're against technology. Um, at first they had this, uh, the scapegoats insurance industry, insurance industry. Yes, it's a lot of waste. It's an insane system that if we have third party pay, if I would go with your credit card, to shop, then maybe I would not be as frugal as, as I would be otherwise. It's kind of um, then the whole idea of, of employee provided insurance is, is a, it's a, this this idea was was perpetuated by our first socialist president Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who came up with this idea because because uh, uh, he thought that 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 would be the best the best kind of bet that they put price controls and wage controls during the Second World War. And so employers were competing for workers, providing them this or that benefits, this or that benefit. And the idea of Roosevelt was that healthcare is so important, should be provided by employers. Why? I mean, well, how about food? How about clothes? How about housing? Maybe that should be provided by employers as well. What was the society, what was the system which provided free health care, free food, free housing, who knows? Slavery, that's right. Slavery, if you look at the slavery, yeah, that's what, all, what it's all about. Yes, all for free. Definitely, that, that, this, is a, this is a very sad thing, especially when you see a lot of doctors, medical doctors, really, it's kind of 
I, when, when Mr. Putin, a proud KGB colonel, was, was elected on the relatively three elections uh, of, 2000, of 2000, as the president of Russia, 70% of public vote he got. My last article in Russia, in Russian language published, was uh, meat voted for a meat grinder. So it's not only meat voted for a meat grinder. So now in my travel plans, I kind of trying to avoid that place <laughs> because, because life expectancy around Mr. Putin drops like a rock. And he has all this, <laughs> has I think this um, very exotic menu of poisons and <laughs> in Kremlin and he looks, um, this, by the way, it's, it's not I'm making it up. In this video, which is documentary, uh, there's a video also about deadly m medical experiments conducted by our ally, by the Soviet Union at the end of the Second World War on, on, on gulag prisoners. When, and it's the most gruesome, I would say, part of this video. They, then all of them were killed uh, just to kind of, uh, not to, not to have any information leak. Uh, so that's the, and they had the special poison department since 1942. The KGB was established poison department. They tried these poisons on all these gulag prisoners and now they're trying that poisons on journalists or on, on personal enemies of, of Mr. Putin, of Mr. Putin. But returning back to this, so in the United States, definitely we are pretty far from that green pictures that I showed you. Pretty far, but you never know. For example, I, the, who could say that Soviet Union, an evil empire designed for tens of thousands of years, would implode like that in, a, in one day? In the glorious day of December 24, 1991. Soviet Union, no more. So it's, uh, I would say that it is, it is really, uh, really, I think it's very important for us. Or, we had this wonderful presentation about Canada, that they were taking freedom step by step, and then people forget what the normalcy is. The people forget what the normal life is. Then people forget what medical care will, should look like. Because they have, for example, a lot of made up, I think, statistics as well, about satisfaction of healthcare systems. And you can see that people are extremely satisfied with healthcare systems, say, in Romania, for example, or United Kingdom, or other places where there is plenty of literature that healthcare is either non-existent or pretty bad. Uh, the same waiting lists or whatever. In Sweden now they are trying to privatize healthcare. In Sweden to avoid Canadian pro problems, they just passed, passed a, 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 a law that, that the waiting list to see a doctor should not exceed six months. This is the law right now in Sweden. So that you can see that they, they're all struggling, they're all trying to, uh, to do something about that. And however, if you will ask a Swede, um, then many of them would say, yeah, we have good, good healthcare system. Why? Because they don't know anything else. They don't know anything else. And doctors in many countries, even in socialized medicine, in the Soviet Union, there were some doctors which were murderers. Some butchers, some doctors were pretty good. Some doctors were very devoted and compassionate people, compassionate people. And definitely patients of that doctors would, would, be, would be happy with what they had. Uh, however, having said that, you should realize that if you have a socialized health care, uh, then you cannot, you cannot change doctors. There's no choice. It will be the same as unified school district. If you are zip coded here, then you need to go to this place. So there is no portability, no nothing, because otherwise, the, from economics point of view, you can either have a monopsony or monopoly of healthcare. One, for example, one payer system would be a monopsony when the government is only one payer, so the government can pay. It's a market, it's a market where only one buyer, and the buyer is not you, consumer, the buyer is government who assumes the role of consumer. And he doesn't care about what is being consumed because government officials have their own system. So there's nothing personal about that. So it's a monopsony, which is a form of monopoly with, with one buyer, with one buyer. Or it can be a monopoly, sole provider, like United Kingdom, for example, or Sweden, or, 
or Soviet Union when it was before, when everybody was, was kind of like a part of national health system like in the UK or, or, or government civil servants, the, 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 the doctors would be, uh, would be just government employees, government bureaucrats. So this is, both of the system are economically extremely inefficient because what all monopolies, why we don't like monopolies? Because monopolies usually underprovide and overcharge. That's the essence of monopolies. Nothing wrong with a, with a monopoly which would be nice, but there's no such thing. Because if you are a true monopoly, then you would, you, you would tend to, to supply less and charge more, and charge more. And speaking about these charges, extraordinary cost of our medicine, we should keep in mind, we spend right now about 15.5% of our gross domestic product on healthcare. All right, well in Russia they spend about 4%. But Russian families spent about 11% of their family budget on booze. So that will give us about 15%. Should we do that? <laughs> Should we save on health care and do something else? Maybe nicer and whatever, funnier at least. Um, this is ridiculous. Why? Because we are the richest country in the world. Health care, health, I mean the, the demand for health, demand for health is Normal good, that means the wealthier you are, the more you demand that, the more you demand that. And, uh, and definitely we could save. I mean, I uh, was listening to Greg Monkey, um, the George W. Bush's economic advisor, but I don't hold that against him. He, he, he resigned, on <laughs> he resigned uh, um, uh, properly. And uh, um, yes, he, he is giving this wonderful examples. I mean, Bypass surgery, say, in 1950, how much it would cost? What we're talking about medical inflation. Or hip replacement in 1950, how much it would cost? Zero, point zero, right? Zero, point zero. What? No such thing. No such thing, right. So we could save a lot if we would not develop that, right? Yes, so then it would be, and in the, in the Soviet Union or in today's Canada or in many other places, they would put a lead because Demand for health care, demand for health, I would say, I wouldn't say demand for health care. Demand for health is unlimited. It is unlimited. It's a, you, it definitely should be rationed in this or that way, in this or that way. But the whole idea is that we should have equal access. That what makes, that what makes socialists mad. That, and they want, and they want, well, them themselves, the leaders, would have another system. But, but to attract the gray masses, they need to provide them with a candy of equal access. That there was no people, maybe richer than them, but would have a better care than themselves. And because they cannot provide good health care for everybody, then what, at first what they do, they destroy good health care for those who already have that. And that's, uh, and that's exactly, in many cases, as I would say, many people in the United States are going after that. I spoke at some ethics, be a bioethics conference, and one lady after the conference, she said, come on, she said, I don't have this good health care insurance, and I don't want anybody to have that same kind of thing. So that's uh, exactly, that's social envy. You can build almost anything. And that's what socialists did in Soviet Union. You, you murder the rich, and then you murder the rich, you, you, you destroy religion, you destroy family, and then, and then you don't have Second Amendment definitely, you, you, you uh, disarm people, and then you are naked before the big government, which can then do whatever they want to do with you. So that's the that's kind of, <laughs> I hope, scenario which would not materialize. But we should be vigilant because, because we have many people, I think, in Washington, D.C. and other places who would like to have this kind of scenario. Many people on the left are saying, well, President could not, did not accomplish what he promised. Uh, he, did, he was not effective. I think he was extremely effective. In two years, he completely changed American economy, American society. Uh, and this is, this is pretty scary to me, because what is socialism? Socialism is government ownership. It's government, that's no other definition. I would agree with Karl Marx that it is government ownership, that when government takes charge, that's socialism. And, uh, and look what we have right now. We have nationalized automobile industry. We have uh, 
almost nationalized financial sector. I recently walked into accountants meeting just to listen because I'm teaching a lot of accounting students to, to see what they talk about. Now if you're hiring an accountant, if you're hiring an accountant, you are hiring an IRS FBI agent whom you will be paying, but this person needs to report you or for any irregularities, not to you, but to these agencies. This is a, this is a, this is, this is just a, uh, now they have a federal program on finding out where you are turning your, turning your uh, cell phone into GPSs. Uh, then in healthcare bill, there is a, a great idea that you should pay sales taxes and you should track those people who are buying gold. What does it have to do with healthcare? What does nationalization of student loan industries? What does it have to do with in healthcare? It's in the healthcare bill, in the healthcare bill. So a lot of other things which really kind of uh, really uh, uh, worrying, worrying. Too big to fail, I mean this whole idea. What was too big to fail? Soviet Union definitely, it failed miserably. And, uh, and when we are trying to bail out companies and whatnot, then we're picking losers, winners, and the most awful thing, we are destroying our competitiveness on the world, in the world economy, in the world economy. So that's kind of the issues I, I I'm so sorry I kind of was pretty gloomy after this wonderful lunch and after this wonderful workshop that you had, that you had. But I'm thinking that if you, if you would, um, would uh, like to, to um, maybe to discuss some issues or have a questions, uh, some, some questions, we still, I think, have some time, right? I remember reading some time ago that uh, President Reagan got it wrong when he said that one-third of Soviet hospitals didn't have hot running water. It turned out one-third didn't have any running water, and uh, <clears throat> two-thirds did not have hot running water. Has the situation changed? It's just changed a little bit, a little bit. And amazingly enough, this is a, this is a, this is a headline from Izvestia newspaper. Um, uh, because uh, just uh, about a year ago, they passed a health care reform bill. They passed one in 2006. That was the first on the way to privatize health care in Russia. Now they have another one, and uh, Oleg Kulikov, who is a member of Russian Duma of Parliament, who sponsored the bill, he, <laughs> he, um, uh, he said, we are switching places with the United States we are going to the positions that they are abandoning. We are happily going to the positions that they are abandoning and they are moving towards, towards socialized health care. Uh, so that's the, in the Soviet Union, in the former Soviet Union, it's easier to, to do these reforms because they saw the, the beast in the eye and they don't want it, and they don't want it. In most, in most other post-communist countries, they're trying. However, having said that, it is a very devious system. It's a system of almost no return. It's a system, it's a road to certain, with no, it's impossible. Can you imagine, for example, today to abolish social security? No, because many people became uh, hooked on that, addicted to this. They do not save for their, for their, uh, for their retirement. They, they completely depend, they think it's a right. So the same with healthcare. Nobody is uh, saving anything, nobody, whatever. People are wrecking their, their bodies because they kind of expect socialized whatever. They don't know that this is a pretty bad service they're getting. But yes, they are trying to, they're trying to get out of there. But I uh, recently uh, was looking for statistics. They had, when Reagan referred to that, in the Soviet Union, they had 36% of hospitals did not have water or sewer system. Can you imagine you have a surgery and then the nurse is going into the well and picking up the, and then, uh, and then boiling some stuff and sterilizing stuff and whatnot, and then you go to outhouse. And uh, uh, then, uh, and that was the country, and that was the country which was sending people to space, which was considered to be a superpower number two, which had more nuclear warheads than anyone else in the world. It's just completely, it's, it's, it's a complete, completely different approach to its human beings, to these expendables, to these balls and nuts who are easily replaceable. So that's easier to make new ones. 
than fix the, the, the old ones. So that's just the, just the attitude, yes. You mentioned a bunch of documents in the Library of Congress that had mm -hmm. come over from someone who had kept copies, and I wonder if contained in those documents would be information about spying in the United States or collaborating with some of the American politicians, and if so, could we get that out on the internet? Could be, yes. That would be very interesting. I would say that, that, that definitely what I'm trying to do, that's, that's one of the reasons that I'm mentioning this archive, Volkogonov archive, so-called, everywhere I go, is that maybe someone would be interested. You see what I mean? I, I am interested enough, but what one person can do with 46 boxes of this of this microfilms so it's uh, it's definitely could be a treasure there could be a treasure there unless some readers came from the agency and purged everything out or from somewhere else yes so that that could be a play <laughs> that was why i'm kind of angry about cia cia was a was an institution which deliberately was lying to American people and American governments about Soviet Union for a very long time. Yeah, I was just wondering if you had a list of, I don't know, two, three, four, five, whatever, things that you think that American citizens who are at least somewhat aware, like many in the room here are, what, what would kind of be your priority of what you, if you could motivate each of us to do or be or say something, what might that be? When I defected to the U.S., well, defect is, doesn't, is not a good word. That means I gave up something I believed in, which was not the case. But uh, when I kind of missed my train and found myself in the United States, I first, uh, first little article I published in Washington Times, I knew a guy from Washington Post, and I sent it to him. He said, no, this is not for us. So he resent it to Washington Times, was published the first it was Maltsev One Day Plan. Maltsev, that's my last name. One Day Plan about Soviet Union, what you should do. Because all these reforms, I mean, many people think, we don't know how to do that, or we should do it steadily, or whatnot. No, you cannot do it steadily. It should be, should be in one fell swoop. One major thing is privatization of everything. To reduce the role of government. Every government, every government is socialist government. You can have a little government, a little socialism. And you can have a big government which fills the whole room, then you'll have full-blown socialism already. It's a matter of degree, not a matter of quality. And it's not my opinion, it's Armen Alkian, very famous economist from University of California, Los Angeles, and plenty of all Austrian economists believe more or less the same. That is a zero-sum game. Either you have rights or government have rights. So if you own property, your government owns you and all the property in the country. So uh, because of that privatization is number one. Another, another thing is definitely education. Education, working with the younger people. Because I'm afraid that we are losing cultural war. We're really losing, because I am in education in the United States already teaching for 20 something years here. And I would say that, that they are winning. They are winning, it's very sad. Then if you will look at other, other cultural, I mean if you look at Hollywood, I don't know. I mean, KGB didn't hate the United States so much as Hollywood does, I think. American values, American everything. Then if you will watch on TV, I, I'm the only, the only thing I'm watching on TV is Netflix. I just not, I, I don't, I want to live longer. I cannot watch CNN or PBS or NPR or whatever. I had kind of a dubious pleasure to be on these programs, but yeah, with a, with a, PBS, I can just tell you a very short story, just to tell you how objective they are. Uh, I was a couple of times with Mr. Lair, and then he calls me and he said, um, looks like liberals want to help Russia a lot, they want to give Russian government like $50 billion, it was I think like 1993 or 94. And the uh, conservatives um, uh, want to give 30 only. Uh, but it sounds very vague to me. Do you have exact number? I said, uh, yeah, I do. Uh, he said, tell me. I said, 0.0. 0. .0. He said, oh, you don't want to help your own country. I said, uh, no, I just don't, I, I don't want to destroy it. And then he, he began to lecture me. He said, well, you know, it's in a civilized discourse, the truth should be somewhere in between. I said, well, if I would come up with 37.7, he said, exactly. 
Exactly. So what he would like to have, to have a 37.7 and 42.1 debating each other from all points of view, so-called. Or they would have an NPR program and they would put a couple of people, one would be just in mad love with Fidel Castro and another just love him quietly and peacefully. And they would debate how, how great is Cuba or whatever. So I think that, that this is the, uh, very important to, to talk to, kind of because these meetings are very important for, I think, all of us, because sometimes you feel insane if, for example, you're in academia, in a liberal academia, then everybody thinks differently. Uh, but from another hand, I think the reaching out is extremely important, reaching out and uh, doing what we do already. It's, uh, it is, uh, I think, very important. But the source of everything is privatization. This is the most important, the private property, pri ownership, ownership of your own body, ownership of your own country, ownership. This is very, very, I mean, this is nothing can replace that. Uh, it's, uh, it's the magic, when Mises, great Austrian economist, used to say it's the magic of private property. And it is a magic. For example, in, when I came to the US, a lot of Russians would come from Russia. At that time, Soviet Union collapsed a couple of years after I exited because nobody listened to my advice. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so um, they would come and um, invite me for lunch and dinner and try to, to be engaged in something they call joint ventures, like to do business. Everybody wanted to do business in the United States. And these guys would have, um, all of them would have golden crowns. Some of them would have a diamond or two in the teeth. So they kind of, it's kind of like in a, in a Walt Disney movies, they would shine when they talk. Uh, some of them would have uh, golden buckets on their shoes, golden buckets on their, and would, would look just kind of like a caricature on, on, on Italian mafia in the 20s. Now, not different, the same very people. They already removed all that, put kind of normal teeth. They were in English pinstripes. They, their kids are going to the best universities here in the United Kingdom and elsewhere. And the same very people, what was, now they all want rule of law, now they all want stability, now they all want economic freedom, and what, no, this is the magic of pride. They have a stake. They don't want to see their kids to being, to being uh, hijacked or whatever, or taken as hostages. Uh, they don't want to have unpredictable, unpredictable government whom they are bribing all the time. So it's, uh, I would say that, that uh, however, we see the completely different story. Uh, I was watching, you know, Blagojevich, is, we have a Socialist Republic of Illinois, uh, just maybe 12 miles from where I live, and they had this crooks, I mean, one after another, they kind of have a, um, uh, governors, I think, they will fill all the jails with the governors. <laughs> and, and Mr. Blagojevich, yes, uh, and it was on trial, and there was a crowd there outside, and the crowd was shouting in support of Blagojevich. And they're asking one gentleman, an elderly gentleman, looks nice. They said, why do you support, support um, Governor Blagojevich? And he said, he gave me a free bus ticket. He gave free bus tickets to seniors. You can buy a person for a bus ticket even. Not a, I'm not even talking about health care. In today's United States, we have more than half of the people do not pay any taxes what kind of stake they have. 47% of people are on this or that government programs, or already on the needle, already on the needle. So it's, uh, and that, that's, that's pretty sad, yeah. Uh, Dr. Maltsev, have you heard of a man named Andrew J. Galambos? Um, Andrew J. Galambos, I just happened to have a book of his that I bought from Laissez-Faire Books uh, mm -hmm some years ago that I hadn't read yet, and I was searching around for something to read. Andrew J. Galambos was an astrophysicist who came up with a theory of volition and taught a course in what he called volition, which um, people might be interested in reading because he espoused that thought that you just came up with about the sanctity of property which he divided into primary property, your body, your thoughts, and secondary property, whatever you made out of your life. And um, it's a very interesting book called Sic Itur Ad Astra. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and his name is Galambos. He was Hungarian, and his father fled Hungary and came here. G A L A. Wonderful that there is something good coming from Hungary. Not <laughs> only George Soros. Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah. Quite the opposite. Do we have any other questions? Well then, I, right. would, I would like to thank you so much for, uh, for your attention and for, for the role that you are playing. This is, a, this is wonderful to know that we are not naked before the big government, that we have civil society and that we don't have only AMA. This is very, very important. Well, God bless you. Thank you so much.